could have known this baby boy, born 85 years ago in Shanghai, would grow up to influence not only the history of St. Louis, but also the fate of the world. Well, you were in the Sierra Club by the time you were 12? That was the first age you could join. And in fact, I've now been a member of the Sierra Club for nearly 70 years. For almost 40 of those years, Dr. Peter Raven served as director of the Missouri Botanical Garden, overseeing four decades of unprecedented growth in its size and prestige. Today, he is the garden's president emeritus and remains one of the world's preeminent botanists, a tireless champion of sustainability and biodiversity. The loss of species, which is really unhinging the living capacity of the world and its ability to support us, uh, is not something that people really understand scientifically and it's not something that people want to take their eyes away from their daily activities to worry about. And yet it poses a huge problem for us. Now, Peter Raven's life story, driven by nature, is being told by the man who knows it best, Peter Raven, a globetrotting conservationist who changed the nature of St. Louis. We learn in the book that we almost lost you to the Smithsonian in the 1980s. Well, I was trying to be lost to the Smithsonian, but they chose somebody else. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, I'm really happy at the 40 years that I've spent, 39 years at the Garden and 50 years in St. Louis. I can't imagine spending a more pleasant or happy part of my life than that. Peter Raven, thanks very much for joining us today. We want to let folks know that your book, Driven by Nature, is available in a number of places, including our friends at The Novel Neighbor. So check that out. I think some signed copies are there as well. So why a memoir now? You've been retired for a number of years. Uh, was there something that, that made you decide, first, that you should do one, and secondly, you should do one now? Well, Jonathan Kleinbart, who was assistant director around 20 years ago, suggested that I might do one about my life, sort of an autobiography, and uh, thought about it, and somehow I got started. And um, then I, off and on, off and on, took me seven or eight years to write it. Did you have a journal or keep a journal through your life? There's so many details in there, well, not just about the plants, but the people and the trips and... Well, two things that give me more information than most people would have if they start out on a similar project. One is that collecting plants, you write the numbers in and the days and where you were. And then the other is, since I've been at the garden in 1971, almost 50 years, um, I've had calendars, day-to-day -day calendars. So I have a, a clearer idea of where I was on a given day than the average person probably. Well, of course, we know where you were on day one, and that was Shanghai, as we learn in the book. You were born in China and have been back, what, 30 or 40 times, I think, since then. Yeah, man, more than that, probably even working on the co-editing the new account of the plants of China, which was a very big project that started after things opened up between the U.S. and China. But Northern California is really where you grew up. It, and it is. It seems like from reading the book, it would have been the ideal place to sort of uh, hatch a botanist, so to speak. Well, right. Um, yeah, I'm about a fifth generation Californian, third generation on both sides at the University of California, Berkeley, which is really unusual. Yeah, about um, 5,000 species of plants are found in California and of only about 15,000 in the whole U.S. and Canada. So California is very rich, and about half of those found in California are found only there, and uh, makes a very interesting pattern that makes it fascinating to try to put the pieces together and look at it. Certainly excited me. I got excited in bugs first, though, insects, and sort of went on. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about that, because I know I've heard a number of interviews of people of a certain age 
uh, particularly artists, people who made great contributions, who had polio as a child. And because they oh. were, you know, stuck at home, read books, this, that, and the other thing, and sort of developed uh, unwittingly their, their interest in something. In your case, it was much less serious in a shorter period of time. It was the measles. Right. Of course, measles were common when I was a kid and talking about the 1940s. And um, when you had them, you had to stay out of school for two weeks to be sure you wouldn't infect people. And while I was in bed, my mother gave me a book on insects. And we were living in the Richmond district in San Francisco on old sand dunes that had been built on after the earthquake, after San Francisco began to regroup itself after the big earthquake in 1906. And uh, uh, there, there were still many insects in the backyard. I rushed out and began looking at those like cabbage butterflies eating our cabbage. You could immediately see the eggs and the caterpillars and the chrysalis and the adults and uh, just fascinating details about them. But then I drifted over into plants, of course, hugely influenced by the student section, a, a student group at the California Academy of Sciences. A, a large museum started in the 1850s, which was in Golden Gate Park, but only about four blocks from our house. Well, you were in the Sierra Club, what, by the time you were 12? Uh, well, um, that was the first age you could join. And I joined to go on local trips to be able to look at the plants on the local trips. And in fact, I've now been a member of the Sierra Club, as you could figure out if you're really quick in, in arithmetic, for nearly um, 70 years. But I'm one of the two or three uh, longest standing members of the Sierra Club, which is rather amazing. It's also interesting that the Sierra Club is very political now, which I think is totally appropriate for reasons that become kind of obvious in the book. but. Back in the 50s when I joined, it was the 40s and 50s. Uh, it was conservation-oriented, but you wouldn't call it political. Well, and back in the 40s and particularly the 50s after the war, uh, I'm assuming that conservation was the complete opposite of what the gestalt of society was. Then it was probably consume, consume, consume. You know, it's interesting. Uh, conservation in general before that was largely what you do with tigers and lions and bears. And uh, nobody worried about many, many species disappearing at once. That, that didn't really become obvious until, we say, the late 60s. But as you say, right after World War II, when the economy was picking up again and people had strong memories of the depression that preceded the war, it was absolutely consume and consume. And in fact, it was quite ordinary in those days in the 40s and amazing to drive along in your car and just sort of throw garbage out the window, which of course nobody would tolerate now. It seems completely wrong, but Nobody really thought about it then. It was funny. It was normal. It was a sign of uh, excess. And, of course, people say, well, make America great again. Well, after the war, because we destroyed the economies of, very, of most of the big countries or they were destroyed fighting with us, we actually for a while controlled half of the economy of the world. And, if, and we'll never control half the economy of the world again. And indeed, if people consumed at the level that we do in the United States, it would take about five coffees of planet Earth to support them if everybody in the world consumed at the level that we do. So there's not a lot of room to become greater, bigger, more selfish, or consume more than we do now. There are any number of surprising details about your life and your family in the book. There's a connection to the Donner Party and a connection to the Golden Gate Bridge. But the thing I've, that really struck me is that you were terribly shy. Your interest in botany had some effect on that. Well, um, you know, in school, uh, shy, become less shy by telling jokes things like that and just getting into conversations and but giving talks and things when I was 10 or 12 years old I was very shy and I guess I just uh, did it so often I got used to it and then the other one that set me up was the student section at the California Academy of Sciences which not only gave one a chance to learn about nature in very many different ways from the teachers and all 
Uh, but at the same time, it offered access to the departments at the academy, which were avenues for me to learn much more about insects and then later plants than I could have otherwise. Having overcome your shyness, you were already a teacher at Stanford in the, when you were 26, I think, probably the youngest on staff, I'm guessing. If, uh, well, let's see. Not much older than the students. Well, you get in there and uh, you start lecturing and you see all the, and, and in those days it was full of, uh, of course, uh, veterans and uh, so forth, who are definitely older than I was. And I have to talk to these people? What if they get angry? What if they walk out? Then, by the late 60s, when everybody was in pretty much a state of uh, rebellion of one kind or another, uh, I would lecture sometimes uh, at a few, on a few occasions to groups of 200 people in an auditorium, some of them with balloons tied around their big toes, some of them a smoking pot, some of them reading newspapers, dogs wandering in and out of the classroom. And if you do that, you, you overcome your shyness pretty fast and learn to focus on those at least few people in the, in the room who may be interested in what you're saying. Yeah, California in the 1960s must have been quite an experience. Well, we see in the book pictures of you, you sort of fit the mold. You had the beard and the... Yeah, in the late 60s for sure. And uh, it was a very confusing time, no doubt about it. It's sort of in that time period, maybe a little bit later. Uh, I didn't realize this about you either, that you're a scofflaw. You, <laughs> you were arrested in South Carolina. Yeah, uh, just collecting plants there, basically just for having a California license plate and, and being there. And I wasn't quite arrested, but I was brought to jail and put in a cell. The problem was my fr a friend that I was on the trip with had dropped me off to collect to insects visiting the plants on a certain species with the permission of the landowner uh, and then going back to the motel to go to bed and go to sleep for some more sleep because the insects were out early in the morning and uh, so the people came out and suddenly there I was with people pointing shotguns at me and handcuffing me and as we left the man said uh, the sheriff said well he said uh, I don't want to see you boys in this county again and we always imagined being back there, you know, 30, 40 years from then and seeing him drive up 80 years old in a car and say, I thought I told you boys not to come around here again. <laughs> anyway, that was scary. Yeah, I mentioned at the time it really was. Because, uh, you know, the Schwerner and the others who were murdered were murdered around then and Orangeburg where, where it happened. Uh, there were big uh, demonstrations at the junior college and all soon enough, and it was an upsetting time, very upsetting time. You had several occasions where you visited the Missouri Botanical Garden before you were ever in charge of it. Was the first time you went with your dad on a cross-country trip? Right, I did, a, I did, after graduating with my PhD from UCLA, I did a year postdoctoral at Kew Gardens in the British Museum in England got a uh, Ford over there, got um, left-hand drive, so it would be good if we brought it back, always planning to bring it back, and uh, brought it back, sent it back to Boston, and then my father flew out, and we were able to drive across the country going back, which was a great time to visit with one another and everything that I shall always uh, you know, cherish. And uh, we visited a couple of the big botanical institutions then so I could look at the uh, specimens that they had of the particular groups that I was interested in studying. And uh, one of them was the Missouri Botanical Garden. And uh, it was a very different place then. The Climatron had, had just been, uh, this was uh, 1961, the Climatron had just been completed the year before, 59-60. And it was a big attraction. Uh, the garden had been going downhill, downhill, downhill. And then when they built the Climatron, that rejuvenated it. It was a, like it was built on Buckminster Fuller's principles, a geodesic dome. It was the second largest geodesic dome that had been built up till that point. And it was the largest use of lucite plexiglass for construction. So it was quite it was quite an attraction. And, began to reverse the garden's uh, fortunes, but 
they sputtered again. They sputtered through the 60s. And, uh, but I visited several times then in the 60s for botanical meetings about projects and things. And the, music, the uh, garden was quite familiar to me when, I, when they first approached me about the possibility of coming as director. How did you go from, from teaching to leading a garden? It wasn't a natural progression necessarily. Well, one thing about botanical gardens that many people may not know is that they started as branches of medical schools because they started so people could learn about plants to cure people. So gardens have very often been associated with universities. And our garden, uh, which Henry Shaw opened to the public in 1859, in 1884, they made an agreement with Washington University and for the for the next 140 near 140 years, uh, it's always been partly academic. The first PhD from Washington University was a graduate of the Garden, and even more interestingly, was a woman who was studying botany. So they were like university departments. So part of the reason that they would look for somebody, or part of the reason that I would consider going there, was the academic side of it. So the academic side of it, the educational side, and the display side. And they, they were all factors. Would you say there's a great deal of the influence you had on the garden is the emphasis on research? Uh, the garden was always partly a research place, but it uh, became much larger during the years I was there. We took various opportunities to become active around the world. and. Uh, the garden had had relatively little direct activity around the world, although its herbarium, its collection of pressed plants to study, was worldwide. And uh, even more especially, its library is very large and international library. It and was named after you. Ah, well, it is now, yeah. And one of the things you brought to the garden to begin with was a master plan. Nothing like that before existed? You know, when I got there, only about a third of what the 79 acres of the garden was actually cultivated or what you consider a garden. So things like the Japanese garden, the home gardening center, the boxwood garden, the Chinese garden, uh, and all of that, the um, Schnook educational garden, children's garden, all those were built subsequently. And the garden, garden in Henry Shaw's day went only from where the Lenin house is uh, to the uh, north side of the uh, mausoleum area. In other words, it didn't include his uh, country house, which was near there. Had a tower, though, he could look out over his garden from. Well, and and being the, the head of the garden, you lived at the garden for almost 40 years. What's that like having that as your, I don't know if it's your front yard or your backyard, but... Well, it's very good. You might think it'd be overrun with people, but it's not. And it's a very nice, good-sized house with a few acres around it, right down in the corner there. And one of the one of the disadvantages, though, I I find is uh, you'd uh, walk out of your house and you'd virtually be at work. You know, about a hundred yards a walk. And uh, actually, like many people, uh, driving into work and things like that often afford very good times to think about what's going on. If you wake up and slam you're there no time you have to think pretty fast but you could walk around you could Quick certainly on your feet. do a walkabout and, and absolutely uh, that's a huge advantage well, st louisans owe you such a debt of gratitude for all of the things that you did to the garden that that came up while you were there japanese garden you mentioned other popular features but the thing that may be the most influential people don't necessarily know about is the zoo museum district getting the garden into that district was no small feat and made a big difference to do that we had to work very hard on uh, public appreciation of the garden during the 1970s especially my first decade here uh, because I realized that, you know, gardens naturally, the research program could be supported more widely, but a garden, the gardens themselves, the displays, the events, are not going to be supported by people in Milwaukee. They're going to be supported by people here. So one of the things I knew for sure is I had to get the interest of the people here by developing things and building new things and taking advantage of the whole area to develop into interesting places for them, having events in the garden that they care about. So we were able to increase the, 
the membership of the garden from about 2071 to about uh, 10,000 in, in 81. And, and that and the events and the interest in building and so forth, that's what made it possible for us to, to have enough a public attention and appreciation to get the vote approving the Zoo Museum District. We learn in the book that we almost lost you to the Smithsonian in the 1980s. Well, I was trying to be lost to the Smithsonian, but they chose somebody else. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, I'm really happy at the 40 years that I've spent, 39 years at the Garden and 50 years in St. Louis. I can't imagine spending a more pleasant or happy part of my life than that. Conservation obviously has become a large part of your life, has been a large part of your life. What what part of the world worries you the most right now? Uh, in terms of conservation, um, Global Footprint Network, which is a good website to look up, calculates that we're using about 175% of what the world can produce on an ongoing basis, which means that we're wearing it all down. And in the poorer parts of the world, we're really wearing it down because they're using everything they've got. Uh, 10% of the world's population lives in, in those countries, uses about 40% of everything the world can produce. So the, all the poorer parts of the world are being worn down fast and are turning out not to have anything to export. And of course, or not of course, most of the biological diversity in the world, most of the different kinds of plants and animals are in the tropics. So. That worries one the most because it's fine for us to say to uh, Upper Volta or something, you've got to preserve your chimpanzees and your gorillas. Uh, without money, how can they do it? You know, we've really all got to get together in a way, understand one another, take care of and pay attention to one another for that to work. Does this anti-science atmosphere that seems to be going around, is that uh, affecting conservation? Uh, I don't think so, not particularly. Um, the loss of species, which is really unhinging the living capacity of the world and its ability to support us, uh, is not something that people really understand scientifically, and it's not something that people want to take their eyes away from their daily activities to worry about. And yet it, it poses a huge problem for us. And every time the human population drops a little, which is actually extremely positive in terms of what we have to consume out there, everybody's, oh, the, the economy won't go on growing. But uh, what are we going to have? We're going to have the economy going on growing to where people are standing shoulder to shoulder over the entire surface of the earth. I mean, logic ought to tell people that that's not necessarily a good thing. Well, and you bring up the point, too, uh, very in a very timely way about COVID-19. Toward the end of the book, you talk about how we're creating uh, an atmosphere where that sort of thing is going to be more prevalent. Lots more uh, epidemics, and we need to work on how to, how to encounter them, how to confront them when they first appear, and how to bring them under control. What's the botanical connection or the conservation connection to something like COVID? The more you destroy the forest, the more those things come out. They relate; those seem to be related to animals in meat markets in China taking uh, viruses that were originally present in bats there and then being consumed. And the forest is cut, and the diseases spread. As as malaria, for example, spreads. As all diseases spread in areas that are cleared and simplified. You still have an office at the garden which I know you haven't been able to get to because of COVID. Uh, but uh, with your connection to the garden, where do you see the future of the garden going? Well, uh, Peter Weiss Jackson, the, the current director of the garden, who's been director for over 10, 11 years now, uh, is taking it in the direction of conservation, which is what we hoped he would do when we, when we hired him in the first place. Um, on the other hand, with... Um, species becoming extinct so rapidly, uh, we have a situation where uh, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature and other groups that try to find out estimate that as much as 20% of all the organisms in the world could become extinct during the next uh, uh, several decades and maybe up to double that many by the end of the century. 
that means that we're living in the, in the only time when many of these organisms will be here with us. So learning about them, learning that they're there, finding out about their patterns of distribution and all, uh, we're taking, we're doing that on the last chance to do that. We're in a major extinction event now. It's going to change, and people later are going to wonder, are going to want to know very badly all they could about those organisms. At the same time, we say we have seven million specimens in the garden. Probably, it could be as many as a majority of those are from populations, individual places or occurrences of individual plants where they don't really exist anymore. And, and as time goes by, more and more of them are going to be fragments or pieces of species that don't exist anymore. Plants are easier to conserve than animals because you can keep the seeds, you can preserve the seeds, and you can keep them alive much easier. But uh, it's not all that easy, and it's going pretty fast. This is, uh, by way of wrapping up, not the sort of question I would normally ask somebody uh, who's written a book, except that you bring it up a few times in the book yourself, uh, your personal life, your family life. You've been married four times. Uh, it sounds, it, you could have easily left that out or just put it in as a, you know, autobiographical detail, but it seemed like you were trying to make a point about how to live life. People really need to consider how they want to spend their time. Uh, our academic system, our system advance in business or science or anything else is based on working day and night at business and all. It's, it's well known and many television programs are kind of devoted to that of marriages falling apart because people are so devoted to their work. Um, it's not that people can't choose to do that, but probably they ought to decide what they want to do and stick to that. I mean, to try to do both and then destroy your marriages and things and your relationships while you go and neglect your children is definitely not a good idea. Uh, on the other hand, there are choices that people make and they will make. And I guess what I would argue is think about them very clearly and try to decide what you really want to do. Don't just let it happen to you. And I suppose, aptly in your case, stop and smell the roses. Well, <laughs> that's right. And of course, uh, I've been married to Pat, who's a PhD in, in horticulture from Ohio State for 20 years now. We have a lovely, happy, supportive marriage, and uh, so it is. But. Uh, it's uh, something you something you really need. Pay attention to life. Don't just tumble along. I think I did a lot of tumbling along. Well, we're lucky that you landed here and you <laughs> tumbled down the way. Well, as I said, I can't imagine having been any place where I would have been happier or more productive for those for that half century that I've been here in St. Louis. Before we let you go, one thing that's in the book. Can you do the turkey call? You should put that in the audiobook version. <laughs> <laughs> Great stuff. Dr. Peter Raven, thanks so much for being with us today. We really appreciate it. It's been a real pleasure. I really appreciate the opportunity. I've spent a great deal of my life working in one way or another to help improve our knowledge of Earth's biodiversity understand and appreciate the myriad species with which we share our planet. I've experienced great joy in discovering more and more about our rich biological heritage. That's a legacy that's the product of billions of years of evolution. At the same time, however, there's been an inescapable element of tragedy and sadness in recognizing that the more we know about what we have biologically, the more acutely we become aware of what we're losing and how quickly it is disappearing. We have to hear the barred owl. Ooh, 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 ooh.